April 1969, a remarkable incident interrupted a Finnish Air Force training exercise. Watched by dozens of pilots, seven round objects appeared in the sky above the airfield at Pori in western Finland. As a jet fighter approached the objects, they rose in formation and made off at high speed, heading north. They flew into a headwind measured at 180 kilometers per hour. Fighter pilot Karmo Tukeva was ordered to pursue the strange intruders. What was his reaction? Ainoa tapa reagoida käskyyn oli kääntää nokka kohti Porin kaupunkia ja lähteä tarkistamaan tilannetta. Voitteko kuvailla, minkälaisia nuo pallot oli? Pallot olivat yleismuodoltaan pyöreitä, ilman mitään tarkkoja äärirajoja ja väriltään voisi kuvailla vaaleaa kellettä. Kuinka lähelle te pääsitte niitä palloja? Etäisyyttä on... on täysin mahdotonta määrittää, koska palloilla ei ollut mitään tarkkoja äärirajoja eikä mitään kiintopisteitä ollut käytettävissä. Kun no pallot sitten lähtivät liikkeelle, kuinka suureksi arvioitte niiden nopeuden? Nopeuden määrittäminen on, on täysin mahdotonta. Oma nopeut on yli noin 700 km tunnissa ja pallot hävisivät moninkertaisella nopeudella kohti pohjoista. Oletteko löytänyt jälkeenpäin ulle pallolle mitään normaalia selitystä? Mitään normaalia selitystä kyseisille ilmiölle on kyllä vaikeaa vaikea kuvitella. UFOs, unidentified flying objects, have shattered our view of the world. Astronaut Edgar Mitchell said after his visit to the moon, we all know that UFOs are real. All we need to ask is where do they come from? Soviet cosmonaut Grechko has said, if I were free to tell what we've experienced in space, the world would be astounded. The history of the world is full of mysteries. Strange structures, drawings and sculptures whose origins are still unknown. Could they be evidence of visitors from space? So far, there have been more than a hundred thousand reported sightings of UFOs all over the world. From Brazil to Lapland in the far north of Scandinavia. Despite official secretiveness, researchers around the world have collected detailed information on the behavior of UFOs. Although many supposed UFO sightings can be explained in normal terms, the remaining genuine UFOs have displayed common characteristics that warrant scientific investigation. The name Flying Saucer was coined by pilot Kenneth Arnold in 1947. The United States Central Intelligence Agency has revealed that Hitler's Germany was among the first to investigate UFOs. The, the first major activity that happened upon the planet in terms of extraterrestrial intervention or involvement actually happened uh, with greater intensity during the Second World War in Europe. It's pretty well acknowledged today that the Third Reich in Germany was involved with the extraterrestrials. I, my contention is that indeed, because of the prosecution of the war, uh, everything associated with aerial phenomena and so forth had to be classified for the sake of the war and the Allied powers, because uh, we didn't want the, say, the enemy at that time being the Third Reich to know that, of course, we uh, were suspect that they had um, uh, possible alliance with, say, extraterrestrial intervention. 
Uh, in the early stages of all of this, uh, during the, say, Truman administration, we were actually, and also the Eisenhower administration, we were actually approached by good ETs, and they warned us that we should not become involved with the ETs who would follow them later on. UFO sightings have multiplied during times of international crisis. There was a significant increase in UFO observations during the Second World War. The war laid the foundation for the human conquest of space and for the destruction of life on Earth. Virgil Armstrong asserts that UFOs have provided much technical information. I had started this really in 1980 uh, in Oakland Auditorium in Oakland, California, when I stepped forward and I lectured to about 800 people and my subject was government conspiracy and UFOs. Uh, I saw top secret documents saying that an unidentified flying object had landed at White Sands, New Mexico. And then of course I followed that by wire. I was not actually physically involved in the capture itself. It was no capture anyway. It soft landed in the middle of White Sands, New Mexico. And then we kept on our observation. Later on, of course, we, were, we managed to get inside of it. We found five bodies. From the end of the 1940s, the United States and the Soviet Union intensified their research into UFOs. Much of the research was prompted by observations by the military and by commercial pilots. Officials have attempted to conceal their UFO investigations and to play down the significance of the UFO problem. In the late 1970s, the Freedom of Information Act in the United States permitted the release of official documents more than 30 years old. Following court proceedings initiated by UFO researchers, more than 2,000 official reports on UFOs were made public. Hundreds of other reports remained secret after court rulings that their release would have constituted a threat to national security. United States Marine Major Donald Kehoe, who served as chairman of the UFO research organization NICAP, was the first to allege in the 1950s that the authorities were concealing UFO reports. Kehoe had in his possession extensive material on UFO sightings by aircraft pilots. Professor of Astronomy J. Allen Hynek was for more than 20 years a specialist on UFOs with the United States Air Force. Gerald Ford, Republican Party leader in the U.S. Congress, proposed the establishment of an official UFO research committee. Edward U. Condon, a doctor of physics, became its first chairman. Hynek, a member of the committee, noted that officials were unwilling to tell the truth about UFOs. He broke off cooperation with the Air Force and set up a private UFO research organization. To this day, the superpowers are still faced with an unsolved mystery. Recently, it was disclosed that when President Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev met in 1985, the UFO problem formed part of their discussions. The Freedom of Information Act has revealed a mass of new evidence that an unknown spacecraft landed at Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. United States Air Force personnel who arrived on the scene found the UFO as well as the bodies of visitors from space. According to eyewitnesses and written records, military personnel closed the area and prohibited everyone from telling what they'd seen. The mass media were told that the strange object was a weather balloon. Now even so, that's pretty strange because uh, we go back to the, uh, the, the ones we took off the ship in 1948. They were little fellows. They were 3.5 feet tall. The, the largest one was four feet. And he was the senior of the group. Uh, they were humanoid, but they only had four fingers instead of the five and four toes. Uh, they had no ears, uh, they had no nose, no hair, and the mouth was immobile. So although they were basically humanoid, they were totally different. According to the autopsy reports, the creatures had four long-nailed fingers on each hand. Between each finger was a fold of skin. The creatures had gray skin, and their blood, although liquid, was totally unlike human blood in composition. The released documents report that a top-secret task force, Majestic 12, was set up to investigate the case. 
the group received its orders direct from President Truman. The case has been examined in great detail by Canadian nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman. I believe the United States government has the bodies of aliens in its possession, whether it's the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the National Security Agency, the CIA, I have no idea. But I'm certain that with the crash of a flying saucer in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, July, that they recovered not only the vehicle, but the bodies as well. There are other stories about other crashes, but that one's been thoroughly investigated. We've talked to more than 100 persons connected with that. So yes, the government certainly has alien bodies. On the 5th of May, 1989, South African Air Force fighters took off to intercept a strange object that had penetrated South African airspace. One of the pilots fired at the intruder using a new laser-guided weapon, forcing it to land across the border in Botswana. On board the UFO were humanoids who looked amazingly like those found at Roswell. They were short and had only three fingers with long nails on each hand. Between the fingers was a fold of skin. Their eyes were wide and slanted and their skin was a bluish gray. The incident was investigated by Anthony Todd, who served for 25 years as a police officer. The UFO came down and crashed in the Kalahari Desert. And when the authorities retrieved the UFO, which was intact, two live alien beings were found inside it. The craft and creatures were eventually transported to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in America. This in, uh, information came to us from South African intelligence sources. I've seen them several times. I've um, been within 100 meters of one of these uh, craft. Um, a huge uh, saucer-shaped object with a dome on top with uh, portals around the outside, colored lights rotating around the bottom, and the whole object glowing. I've um, signaled on one occasion to one, and it t actually turned around and came back to me. Uh, I've seen them several times since, always with witnesses. The, the first case when I was a police officer in 1978. Since making his disclosures, Todd has been the target of threats and other forms of pressure. The belief that UFOs are merely tricks of light, which cannot be scientifically studied, is wrong. Researchers have thousands of reports of UFOs that have left behind physical marks. In January 1981, a UFO landed in the garden of a farmhouse in France. Investigations by the National UFO Research Organization, GIPAN, and the agricultural laboratory, INRA, revealed that something strange had happened to the vegetation growing where the UFO landed. Its biological structure had changed as if it had suddenly aged. The investigators maintained that only extremely powerful nuclear radiation could have caused such a phenomenon. Professor Hynek's research center has more than 3,000 reports of physical marks left by UFOs. Mysterious imprints in fields in northern England have stirred up an impassioned debate about their origin. A British couple tell how they saw the patterns emerging during a time of high winds and an eerie mist. It was, as they said, an experience that made their hair stand on end. From the point of view of human beings, the most worrying marks left by UFOs are radiation burns. Vicki Landrum, an American, suffered severe skin damage when she was exposed to blinding light emitted by a UFO in Texas in December 1980. UFOs are a worldwide problem that's been discussed at the United Nations. On the initiative of Grenada, special sessions were organized in 1978 and 79 and were attended by the world's leading UFO researchers. After the deliberations, the United Nations urged member countries to study UFO cases and report them to the World Organization. In addition to secrecy and pressure, organizations of skeptics have been set up in a number of countries. They systematically deny the existence of all UFOs. 
a true skeptic would be very useful in the field of UFOs or ufology. Unfortunately, what we're really dealing with in most instances are not skeptics. I'm a skeptic. I check things out. What we're dealing with are debunkers, and they seem to have very little to offer because they're the true believers. They know there's nothing to the subject, so they don't give it any attention. They just make proclamations and charges. So skepticism is fine. Debunking isn't very useful. James Randi isn't really a UFO skeptic. He's a debunker. He knows practically nothing about UFOs. In his book, uh, Flim, Flim Flam, he discusses Marjorie Fish's star map work connected with the Betty and Barney Hill case and gets just about everything wrong. Now, a different kind of skeptic is Carl Sagan. Carl and I were classmates at the University of Chicago. I have no idea why Carl has continued to make foolish charges about flying saucers. His most recent one was that every UFO sighting, when carefully investigated, turns out to be either a fraud or a mistake. The statement itself is a fraud because every large-scale scientific study provides loads of sightings that are neither, that are obviously evidence of intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. UFO witnesses have not only been uneducated country folk, their number includes some very prestigious people. Former U.S. President Jimmy Carter, in the company of some 20 other people, saw a UFO on January the 6th, 1969. He was then governor of Georgia. On the 17th of November, 1986, a Japanese airliner followed three UFOs for half an hour. The pilot, flight captain Kenju Terauchi, one of Japan Airlines' most experienced flyers, described the biggest of the UFOs as being five times the size of a jumbo jet. They changed speed astonishingly quickly, and Captain Terauchi stated that the UFOs must have come from outer space. There are thousands of photographs of UFOs. A controversial pioneer of UFO research, George Adamski, photographed UFOs in the 1950s with the aid of a telescope. Adamski claimed also to have seen humanoids and flown into outer space with them. Skeptics have offered dozens of explanations for this flying saucer picture of Adamski's, suggesting it could be the top of a vacuum cleaner or an ashtray. A photograph alone can never be final proof because trick photography allows hundreds of possibilities. The final years of Adamski's life were tragic. He was branded as a trickster. These pictures were taken by an American couple, the Trents, on May the 11th, 1950. Researchers regard them as some of the most reliable UFO photographs. The target of a furor, at least the equal of the Adamski controversy, was Edward Meyer of Switzerland as a result of his photographs and claims of having had contact with humanoids. Even before his claims were investigated, he was labeled the UFO hoaxer of the century. Maya claimed to have been in contact with humanoids who were replaced at intervals of 11 years, the same rhythm as the changes in sunspot activity. Creatures from the Pleiades galaxy told Maya that they were cautious about approaching humans because they didn't want to give rise to a new religion. Maya's pictures show five different types of UFO. The investigation into the Maya case was led by Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens of the United States Air Force, who had studied UFOs since the 1940s. He has a file of 3,000 UFO photographs. I think the question is why do I believe the Swiss case of Edward Meyer is a real UFO contact case? And why do I accept those remarkable pictures as real pictures of UFO? I must say that in the course of the investigation, we found not one photographer, but we found five photographers, five different photographers, all involved in this one case. They all took pictures of the, say, of the spacecraft, the Palladian spacecraft. And on one case, four photographers simultaneously from four different vantage points took pictures of the same craft at the same time. And th those were taken on four different cameras, four different rolls of film. They were processed in four different laboratories in four different countries, and they all showed the same objects. Apart from that, we took four of the best pictures one from each of four different cases 
to the United States with us, where we put them through exhaustive testing, for which more than $60,000 was paid for testing by every known means in modern technology. Now, in the course of testing these UFO photographs, we discovered that we can, can continually eliminate a process. We can always eliminate one more process known in phototechnical circles as processes for faking pictures. And we successfully eliminated all known processes of technically producing pictures and end up with something unknown. We do not know how these pictures were made unless they were made in real time a real spacecraft as alleged by Mr. Meyer. Tried to learn from the UFO's flying characteristics, which is one reason for the secrecy that surrounds them. Recently, the latest test version of a flying saucer was shown in the United States. In Scandinavia, in the late 1980s, the biggest wave of UFOs occurred in the mountainous area of Hesdalen, south of Trondheim in Norway. The most intensive UFO hunt in history was started involving Scandinavian UFO research groups, Norwegian universities, and the Norwegian army. The Hesdalen project produced a host of UFO pictures and scientific data on the behavior of UFOs. In spite of the wide array of scientific equipment used, no logical explanation for the phenomena could be given. Study of the UFO's behavior did suggest that they were guided by an intelligence. UFO investigators from Finland, the United States, and France also took part. Among them were Professor Heineck and a French researcher, Jean-Michel. Uh, for my position, it is absolutely uh, beings from outer space who were trying to contact the people there. But unfortunately, there were not enough people ready to welcome there, to talk with them, and also there have been too much uh, people from outside coming to the spot. Therefore, the activity is now decreasing and uh, UFOs are moving southwards on all the places in central Norway and on the, in the mountains. A wave of UFO sightings similar to the Hestdalen episode took place in the Kusamo district of northeast Finland in the early 1970s. Most of the strange light phenomena and sightings of objects were concentrated on the slopes of Finland's most southerly fell called Isosuete. Strange balls of light have been seen in the same area more recently. It's been noticed in many parts of the world, but UFO sightings are particularly common in mountainous regions. The reason may be magnetic fields, which the UFOs possibly make use of for their avionics systems. The Finnish wave of UFO sightings in the 1970s inspired an extensive research project which was not supported by official or academic circles. Pudasjärven ufoaallon aikana tutkimme ilmiötä välineellisesti ja käytimme siihen kaikkia valokuvausteknillistä materiaalia, mitä oli saatavissa erityisesti infrapuna-alueella. Kykenimme tallentamaan ilmiöitä, jotka eivät vielä tänäänkään ole selvitetty. UFO sightings occur continually around Finland and Scandinavia. On August the 30th, 1986, the couple Myla and Kalle Koivonen were driving to their summer cottage for the weekend. When they'd parked the car and were walking towards the edge of the lake, a series of events began which turned the Koivonen's view of the world upside down. Tulimme rantaan ja tulimme veneeseen, kun vaimoni huomasi taivaalla valon ja sanoi, että sieltä tulee lentokoneja. Vilkasin sen taivaalle ja samassa näin lähestyvän sieltä valopallo, joka silmissä suureni ja pysähtyi noin 30 metri korkeuteen venemme yläpuolelle ja oli läpimitaltaan noin neljä metriä. Minä kysyin Karlelta, onko se helikopteri? Sanoin, että ei se missään tapauksessa voi mikään helikopteri olla, sillä se tuli siihen täysin äänettömästi meidän yläpuolellemme. Tämän sanottua, niin pyysin mailaa antamaan 
kameran, en ole ottaakseni kuvan sitä. En antanut kameraa, koska minusta oli mahdollisimman pian päästävä saareen, koska minua pelotti tämä valoilmiö. Nykäisin perämoottorin käyntiin ja lähdin ajamaan täyttä vauhtia kohti saartamme, mutta valopallo lähti seuraamaan meitä pitäen etäisyyden täydellisesti saman koko ajan ja pysyen tiiviisti kannassamme. Lähellä rantaa tästä valopallosta suunnattiin kolme sädettä kallea kohti. Ja silloin mua pelotti todella, koska mä, mä luulin, että ne hullut tulee nyt meitä kohti. Ihmeellistä asiassa oli, että kameran laskuri osoitti filmin loppuneen, vaikka olin varmasti vasta ladannut sen uudella rullalla. Ja tämä näytelmä kesti kaikkiaan 40 minuuttia, jonka ajan UFO oli seurassamme. The extraterrestrials observed with UFOs are said to come from many different universes and even from different dimensions. Thus they appear to us in dozens of different shapes. Perhaps the most common physical type has a large head, big eyes and is shorter than a human. Some of them seem to have an incredible ability to change their appearance as well as their form of speech. A lot of people who have seen them do not like talking about them and for UFO researchers too, they are a sensitive subject. The question is, what do they look like? You know, they're, they're like people on this planet. There's many kinds out there. Uh, some are 12 foot tall, some are seven foot tall, some are three foot tall. I mean, there's all sizes and forms and shapes. I think the best thing to say that the appearance they give to us is what they think we want to look at. We're really not seeing them in their true form. If they were to take off the, uh, the funny face or something like that, we might be scared to death of them. So, in my opinion, what they try to do is to present themselves to us in a form that's acceptable and not frightening. Now, there's also some, like the tall ones, have sort of a square head, you know. And then, of course, you've got some who look just like you and I. In fact, there's a group called the Nordics. I know of 18. And I'll bet there's at least seven more, so I say conservatively 25 extraterrestrial races. Uh, it's suspected that they may have as high as 26 secret bases throughout the southwest United States. UFOs first made contact with Osmo Liene in 1954, when he was out walking near his home in southwest Finland. Se UFO, johon joudumme tutustumaan lähikontaktissa, oli pyöreähkö, ehkä 5-7 metrin läpimittainen pallomainen alumiinin värinen laite, joka räimäsi ylitsemme keskellä peltoa ja veljeni kanssa joudumme syöksymään ojaan, koska yhteen törmäyksen vaara näytti aivan varmalta. Olennot ilmestyivät meille kotiin keskellä yötä. Vierailuaika sinällään oli aika omituinen, kello oli juuri 12. Lyönyt ja väki tietysti jo vuoteissaan. Ja minä olin ainoa, joka olin hereillä. Oven auettua luulin, että jokin itämainen porukka, lähinnä niin kuin nuoria poikia, olisi tullut väärään osoitteeseen. Heti sisään tultuaan he totesivat, että vai olet jo hereillä, sinua me tulimmekin haastattelemaan. Heillä oli laitteita myöskin mukana, lähinnä nykyisen pienen matkatelkkarin näköinen väline, jolla he sitten kyselyjen edistyessä näyttivät erinäisiä kuvia. Ja aina jonkun asian tullessa esille, siitä näytettiin kuvia. Tällä, tällä pienellä laitteella ja loppujen lopuksi kelattiin minun elämääni eteenpäin myöskin. Ja näin lyhyesti sanottuna ne tapahtumat, jotka minulle silloin kerrottiin, ovat tähän mennessä pitäneet hyvin paikkansa. Joskin tämän saadun tiedon viimeinen kuva on minun kannaltani vähän huonompi, koska siinä oli näytetty tapaturma, jonka uhriksi tulen jossain vaiheessa elämään joutumaan. 
minulle kerrottiin, että se tähdistä, mistä he ovat kotoisin, näkyy maahan rykelmänä, sikermänä. There's been a major wave of UFO sightings in recent years in the former Soviet Union, including the Baltic Republics. Thanks to the new openness in those countries, UFO research has become very active and international. Several big UFO conferences have been held involving hundreds of scientists. In 1989, news of the landing of a reddish, ball-shaped UFO in a park in the town of Voronezh spread around the world. Out of the craft came creatures three meters tall. On seeing them, one eyewitness suffered a stroke and another was temporarily blinded. At about the same time, there were several more sightings of UFOs and humanoids in Voronezh. The eyewitnesses included many children. Recently, in Voronezh, uh, some weeks ago, there were some sightings, UFO sightings and UFO landings also. And I'd like to stress especially that not only schoolboys, not only children were observing these strange landing and sightings and uh, humanoid, uh, human-like beings emerging from the uh, landed uh, spacecraft. There was a great number of reliable uh, witnesses among uh, adults also. It seems to me uh, that uh, now there is uh, some kind of wave of UFO sightings uh, over the uh, Soviet Union. And uh, to my estimation, this number is increasing. Abductions of people by UFOs has been a talking point in the United States for years. Among the first well-researched cases of abduction was that of fishermen Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker in October 1973. As darkness fell, an object 30 meters long landed close to the two men. Remarkable creatures emerged from the UFO. They were about 1.5 meters in height, hairless, with pincer-like hands. The men were scared out of their wits. Hickson started to beat the water with his fishing rod. Parker fainted in his arms. They were anesthetized and carried into the craft. When they reported the incident to the police, they were still close to hysterical. A conversation between the two men, secretly recorded at the police station, indicated that they really believed they had experienced a UFO kidnapping. An abduction at Sergi Pontoise near Paris in France in 1979 aroused widespread attention in France. In the early hours of the morning, three young men saw balls of light, and one of them, Franck Fontaine mysteriously disappeared. Fontaine reappeared a week later. The police investigated the incident thoroughly, but could find no logical explanation for what had happened. Hypnosis revealed that the men had been in contact with a humanoid named Haurio, who warned them of a threat of world destruction. American Bud Hopkins has recently investigated hundreds of abduction cases. Because of the loss of memory often associated with such cases, Hopkins uses hypnosis on the people involved. In terms of finding new abduction cases, I'm running into them daily. People reporting uh, new cases. Sometimes these are uh, new only in the sense that they haven't uh, recalled them before. But I'm also, so in other words, there may be an old case I'm just hearing about for the first time. But I'm also running into very recent abduction incidents. I have one uh, that I've been working on that occurred in late August, uh, another one that occurred in June, and so forth. It's an ongoing phenomenon. There's no reason to say for sure that, you, that abductions are concentrated in the United States. Uh, it is a worldwide phenomenon. One young woman I've been working with uh, had a recent abduction actually in August in the United States, but in prior trips she was abducted in South America and Argentina. She's been abducted in Spain and she's been abducted in various parts of the United States. 
I live in the United States and therefore uh, I suppose I hear about more American cases and since my books are widely uh, distributed in the United States I'm, I'm hearing from more people but I would guess if I were to go to Finland or any other place and that uh, we were able to set up some way in which people could report their possible suspected abductions in a way that they would feel was supportive and trusting and so forth that we would find huge numbers there too I think this is a worldwide phenomenon a growing number of abduction cases have come to light in Finland too. One case concerns Aino Ivanov. Because of her loss of memory, she was hypnotized. It appeared that her car had risen into the air in a cloud. Like many other contact people, Aino Ivanov is parapsychic. Tulossa Siivikon ja Puhoksen kouluilta autolla puolen yön jälkeen olin näillä kouluilla tuntiopettajana. Ja kun auto ylitti tämän Iijoen sillan, silloin näin edessäni sumuseinämän. Ja kun auto sukeli tänne sumuseinämän sisälle, tapahtui jotakin merkillistä. Auto lähti nousemaan ylöspäin. Se kulki käsittääkseni huimalla nopeudella. Ja ensin, ensin oli aivan pimeä. Ja sen jälkeen oli tämmöinen niin kirkkaan sininen sininen kenttä, auto meni sen läpi ja sitten tuli taas pimeä ja mä näin niin kuin kirkkaita valopisteitä, jotka lähenivät ja loittonivat ja heräsin siitä, kun huomasin, että oli niin kuin vähän niin kuin hämärää ja, tuota, ja auto laskeutui tälle oudolle kameralle. Ja sitten mä aloin silmäilemään, että minkälaiseen paikkaan mä oon niin kuin joutunut. Auto oli jonkunlaisessa laaksossa joka puolella oli vuoret ja tuota, ja mä vilkasin maata, se oli niin kuin punas, punasta kiveä tai soraa ja, ja huomasin, että se oli noin suurilla halkeamilla, jopa, jopa viiden sentin halkeamilla. Ja mä ajattelin mielessäni, että tässä paikassa ei, ei ihminen voisi elää, että ei ainakaan tässä vettä saisi. Sitten mä huomasin, että sieltä vasemmalta puolen sieltä vuoren kylkeä alas tuli kaksi henkilöä. Heillä oli suuri pää, eikä ollut hiuksia ollenkaan. Suuret silmät, jossa ei ollut niin kuin, pupille. Ja, ja tuota, pieni nenä ja, ja, ja suu, pieni suu, ei ollut huulia ollenkaan. Ja heidän ihon väri oli aika vaalea. Tämän ensimmäisen matkan aikana musta otettiin sitten näytteitä. Oikeasta käsivarista otettiin niin kuin, viisi, viisi näytepalaa noin, noin, noin puolen sentin välein. To prove the reliability of cases of contact, one of the most investigated abductions concerned the experience of the Hill couple in 1961. On September the 19th, 1961, late in the evening, Betty and Barney Hill were traveling by car on the east coast of the United States when they saw a bright object in the sky. After that, the Hills lost consciousness when they came to, the UFO was gone, and they had traveled nearly 50 kilometers south without being aware of it. Under separate hypnosis, the Hills both told how they'd been anesthetized and transferred to the UFO. Large-headed, large-eyed creatures had carried out medical tests on the couple, including taking a sperm sample from Barney Hill. One of the creatures had shown them a picture that gave the position of their home planet in relation to our universe. Phyllis Van Schlemmer is a contact whose space adventures are of the same type as Aino Ivanov's. I've had meetings with beings from other planets on UFOs twice. Both of them were completely different than the other. My first meeting was a UFO came down, it landed. I saw it, the door opened. For a moment I was very frightened and I said, no, this is an experience, I must go with it. So I boarded the craft and as I entered, I felt uh, the presence of someone in back of me that I didn't see and I entered into the inside of the craft and there were two beings in the craft. They were well over six feet, formed exactly like a human, uh, quite good looking, 
very, uh, appeared to be males. They had a metallic type of costumes on and did not seem to have any openings or fastenings of any kind. Very large crystal blue eyes, if you can call eyes crystal blue. And several years before, uh, in my office one day appeared a space being and it was similar to the, this being that these, these three beings or the two beings that I had seen that was on the ship. The trip was to the moon. They put this type of helmet on. It was like a plastic uh, helmet or plexiglass and it had a rim all around it. It was clear. It was, a, it was double uh, plexiglass or plastic. It had little holes around. And when they put this helmet on me, it created an atmosphere around me that I could breathe. Because I had told them, look, we're on the moon. I want to go out. You can't bring me here and then not take me out on the moon. So they, they put this device on me. And as I walked, it seemed that the surface I uh, kept it above ground, so uh, it, it functioned in this manner. I don't know how it worked. But they opened the door, and one took one hand, and one took the other hand, and they took me outside, and I was so happy because they were holding me. I was floating, and they were holding me down. They did not have problems walking on the moon. They did not float. They, they may have had something to hold them down. I'm, I don't know, because their boots were um, the same as their clothes. But I walked around for a while, and I wanted to walk, and they held me down so I could walk in the dust like this and kick it up and so forth. And uh, we walked around a while, and then they gave me the message, we have to go back. And they took me back in, and took, me off the sh uh, took the device off me. I sat down and came back, and it was when I got off the ship and then went, went back into the house, it was... 6.20 in the morning, and I had left at approximately 2 o'clock. I asked them, how were they able to do this? Because I think our astronauts took a couple of days to get there. And they said that we just did not understand, that we were not um, um, technically advanced enough to understand how to go, through, go this fast. In evaluating cases of contact, it has to be remembered that the experiences are often described either under hypnosis or as parapsychological phenomena. The Finnish doctor of medicine and parapsychologist Rauni Lena Lukanen has experienced a UFO contact under hypnosis. Luonnollisesti ihmiset sanovat, että tämä on mielikuvitusta. Minulle se oli täyttä todellisuutta ja minusta se oli erittäin mielenkiintoista olla ufossa tutkittavana aivan kuin lääkärin vastaanotolla ja tavata olentoja, jonkalaisia en ole aikaisemmin nähnyt. Minä pystyin havaitsemaan kolme neljä olentoa, jotka olivat pieniä, noin 80 senttisiä, enkä pystynyt edes sanomaan, olivatko he miehiä tai naisia. Voitteko kuvailla, miten tuo teidän väittäminen ruumiista irtaantuminen sitten tapahtui? Toisin sanoen, miten te kohtasitte nämä ufot? Se on parapsykologinen ilmiö, jota on varsinkin USA tutkittu hyvin paljon. Kahdeksan miljoonaa ihmistä on kokenut ruumista poistumisilmiön siellä. Se on ilmiö, jota meidän psykiatriamme hyvin huonosti tänä päivänä tuntee. Mutta siinä ihminen tuntee, että hänen tajuntansa kohoaa hänen fyysisen ruumiinsa yläpuolelle. Ja se tajuntana lähtee mihin tahansa. Minun tajuntani näytti lähtevän ufoon. No millä tavalla juuri parapsykologia ja ufot sitten liittyvät toisiinsa? Parapsykologia on tiede, joka tutkii niin sanottuja yliluonnollisia ilmiöitä ja monien ihmisten mielestä ufot ovat yliluonnollisia. Parapsykologia tutkii muun muassa automaattikirjoitusta, se voi tutkia rumista poistumisilmiöitä ja nämä ynnä telepatia ovat muun muassa tapoja, joilla ufoihin voidaan olla kontaktissa. South America, especially Brazil, has for long been among the world's most active UFO areas. The abduction of Brazilian lawyer Antonio Vias Boas is one of the most astonishing UFO stories. On October the 15th, 1957, Antonio Vias Boas was plowing on his farm when a 10 meter long object landed near him. To his surprise, four helmeted creatures came out of the UFO. They grabbed him by the arms and took him into the craft. He was subjected to medical experiments which climaxed when into the room stepped an almost human female creature. The creature undressed, and Antonio found her extremely beautiful. 
the woman invited Antonio to have sexual intercourse, the purpose of which was to cross a human with an alien being. Later, the extraterrestrials returned to show him a small being, Antonio's offspring. Betty Andrea's son, an American whose father was Finnish, met extraterrestrials for the first time on January the 25th, 1967. The beings came to her home and anesthetized her family. They took Betty to a UFO, which traveled to a completely strange place about which Betty remembers only fragments. UFO investigators returned Betty under hypnosis to the time of her UFO experience, and she was able to recount her journey in detail. Betty Andreasson later told of UFO encounters during which she claims to have visited a center for cross-breeding humanoids with humans. These pictures are based on Betty Andreasson's own recollections. In some abduction cases, the kidnapped people have gained the impression that the cross-breeding experiments are not necessarily about developing mankind. Perhaps the most remarkable abductee is the American writer Whitley Strieber. He seriously considered suicide until he met Hopkins, who told him that hundreds of others had met the same the kinds of beings. The, inductions, uh, the final bottom line really can't be uh, guessed at yet. Uh, we don't know what the ultimate goal is. I would say there's no doubt in my mind that the center of it, the focus is on a genetic experiment involving uh, the creation of a hybrid of a mix of aliens and ourselves. Now, what that would lead to, what that means, I have no idea. They've been doing this for a long, long time. I just did an abduction, uh, hypnotic regression with Charles Hickson that involved an experience in 1939. So if we can say, and I have a number of 19 uh, cases from the 30s, if this has been going on for that long, there's certainly been no warlike intentions. Uh, I don't think anyone can point to anything in the environment of the world that would suggest anything evil or malevolent that's come in through the uh, deliberate actions of the UFO occupants. So they've been, let's say, peaceful for a long, long time. That would tend to make you feel there's no warlike idea, and I don't, I don't really fear an invasion. On the other hand, of course, you look at the world today, and there are wars raging here and there, local wars, there's AIDS, a whole new problem we have. The environment is in terrible shape. Uh, and nobody uh, can point to anything in the world that aliens have helped. I don't think there's anybody who can point to something and say, here's a concrete example of intervention, which has been assigned, therefore, friendliness. They seem to be totally neutral. They seem to be totally interested in their own agenda. They're not here to help us and apparently not here to harm us touching about human beings that we are gregarious by nature we love to communicate and I always am touched by the fact that there are scientists who put on bathing suits and go down in underwater tanks and talk to porpoises except the porpoises really don't talk back very much there is some communication but not as much as we would like UFO researchers have often compared the relationship between people and whales with the relationship between humanoids and people. We know that whales have brains as big as our own. It may well be that mutual caution and limited communication stem from the same reason in both cases. Is it for us to teach the whales? Dolphins command water, one of the world's basic elements, noticeably better and more harmoniously than people who throughout their history have destroyed their own kind and at this very moment are threatening the life of the whole planet. I think there are many different reasons for aliens to be interested in what's happening on Earth. In one of my papers I have 25 different ones, but I think the most important reason for any alien civilization in the neighborhood to be concerned about us is that at the end of World War II it was perfectly obvious that we Earthlings would soon be going to the stars because of atom bombs, rockets, and powerful radar. Our new technology would lead us to the stars within 100 years, which is nothing on a cosmic time scale. So if we make one assumption about aliens, that they're concerned with their own survival and security, we would expect them to want to check out all primitive societies in the local neighborhood. And surely from their viewpoint, we are a primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare. So I think they're coming here for their own purposes 
to make sure that we don't bring to them our brand of friendship, which they would call hostility, I think. Okay, Mr. Friedman, but can you tell us why only a few scientists are interested in UFO research? I think there are more than you might expect. I've talked to many professional groups about UFOs, and I find there's a lot of interest. I think the biggest problem, though, and I wish there were a lot more, is that most scientists are unacquainted with the large-scale scientific studies that would lead them to believe that most UFOs, or some UFOs are alien spacecraft. So uh, I'd like to see more join me, but most of them have jobs to do and worry about ridicule if laughter curtain is real. Channel 